Good evening, everybody. Good evening from Maine. And I should say for those of you who are in the, in the West Coast, uh, good afternoon. If you wouldn't mind uh, muting your, your screens, folks, uh, we've got a little bit of feedback there. Yeah. That, that works out well. Well, welcome. And uh, it's going to be an, an exciting presentation tonight. Uh, so glad so many people were able to register for this event and uh, looking forward to it myself. My name is John Diamond. I'm the president and CEO of the University of Maine Alumni Association. And I welcome you to this latest uh, webcast slash webinar uh, that is part of the University Alumni Association's uh, ongoing series. Uh, this one is Constellations and the Christmas Star, and it is featuring Sean Latch of the university's Versant Power Astronomy Center and Major Jordan Planetarium. And uh, he's going to uh, uh, take over in just a minute. I first want to do a major thank you to the sponsor of tonight's event, and that's Novio's Bistro in Bangor. It's one of the Bangor region's best restaurants. And it's owned by Bob Cutler, who is a UMaine alum and somebody who's very involved through Novios and his own personal activity in supporting a variety of university organizations, not just the Alumni Association, not just the uh, Astronomy Center and Planetarium, but also the Collins Center for the Arts. So many thanks to Bob and to the folks at Novios. Uh, Sean is going to do his presentation, and during the program, there'll be uh, with time remaining, we'll be able to take a few questions. So here's how you pose those questions if you're so interested. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's the, the chat button. That's the comic strip icon that you see there uh, in the middle of your screen. If you have a question at any point, just click on that and type it in. And uh, we will relay those questions to Sean uh, later in tonight's uh, webcast. So we'll get to as many of those as possible. And just so you know, we do record these events, uh, these webcasts, so that they can be made available to others uh, uh, for yourself to watch again, or for others who want to watch it later on demand. And we link those to our alumni website. You'll also be getting a survey uh, in a day or so following this. Just ask your feedback about what you thought of the the uh, uh, presentation tonight and to get your ideas for future webcasts. We do about two of these a month and we plan to continue to do so indefinitely even when we're all back to normal and getting together in person. So I keep that in mind as well. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Sean and get our program started. Sean, it's all yours. Great, well, thank you. Yeah, thanks for joining us tonight. We're going to be talking about uh, constellations and, of course, uh, a little bit about the Christmas star since we're heading into the holiday season as well. And I'm going to start by uh, just sharing a, uh, my screen here and uh, get started with a, a few slides here as well. Uh, so first and foremost, I guess, I always like to start off by letting folks know that uh, uh, we're now the Versant uh, Power Astronomy Center. This is a recent change for us. Uh, we were the Amera Astronomy Center up until uh, the end of September this year, and that's when we formally had our name change uh, to the Versant uh, Power Astronomy Center. So that's a little bit new, and, and uh, we're in the process of uh, working on a new logo. So for right now, you're gonna see mainly just text showing our name and things like that, but we are excited about that change. And Versant has been a, a really great um, supporter of things here and uh, in moving our programming forward too. So we're really excited about that. Uh, the planetarium, uh, we are still open. Uh, granted, uh, it is a little bit different. We, we uh, can have 11 people in our theater currently. Uh, and we are doing regular public shows on Friday nights and Sunday afternoons, uh, but we have a variety of, of course, typical protocols in place for COVID. So we have uh, face coverings uh, required for the nose and mouth and cleanings between every show, hand sanitizer stations, all those fun things. So um, our current program list, we have really only a few programs less, left because of the, the way the holidays fall this year in particular, but uh, 
our Friday night show is Asteroid Mission Extreme, which takes a look at asteroids and a little bit about them. And then, of course, we do have a, uh, a traditional holiday mystery of the Christmas star program uh, on Sunday afternoons at two o'clock as well. Uh, all tickets have to be uh, purchased in advance, though, so just a, a note about that if you decide you want to visit us. Well, before we, uh, before I start sharing the night sky, I want to talk about a special event that's coming up this year on the winter solstice, which is December 21st, and that is that Jupiter and Saturn are going to be in conjunction. Now, this happens about every 20 years or so, but this is the first time since 1623 that these planets are going to be this close together. Uh, in fact, on that evening, they're almost going to appear as one. So if you were looking, for instance, this past week, uh, you would notice they're visible right after sunset over in your southwestern sky. Jupiter is the fourth brightest thing you'll see in the sky after the sun, the moon, and the planet Venus. And Saturn, while it's not nearly as bright, is going to be very close to it right now. And over the next uh, few weeks, you're going to see them move very close together until on the evening of the 21st, they'll be within a tenth of a degree of each other, um, which is really close. Almost, in fact, it will almost look like they're one object. Through a telescope field, you'd be able to see them. Uh, and with Jupiter, you'd see its four Galilean moons, Io, Ganymede, Callisto, and Europa, discovered by uh, Galileo, of course, back in 1609. And with Saturn, you would see a couple moons and the rings there, but you would need a telescope at least two inches in diameter to see those rings of Saturn. This conjunction is going to take place in the constellation of Capricornus, and you will want to look for it right away after sunset, because once it gets uh, really about six o'clock or so, uh, they're going to set below the horizon. So you're really going to need to look for this uh, very quickly after, of course, a sunset. So to give you an idea of uh, this, if you've been watching the sky, uh, starting back in October, you know, Jupiter and Saturn were about seven, a little over seven degrees apart. And as they've been coming, they're getting closer and closer. Again, on the 21st, they're going to almost look like they're touching uh, in the nighttime sky. So it's going to be a very special conjunction. Again, we get these every 20 years, but this close doesn't happen every 20 years. So in 20, uh, 2000, they were close together, but they're about more, a little over a half a degree apart. Um, and uh, the next time that they're going to be uh, somewhat as good as this will be in the year 2080. Uh, so you'd have a ways to wait. Uh, there will be a conjunction 2040. It's going to be very difficult to see, though, so and not very close together. All righty. Well, I'm actually going to stop sharing that screen now. Um, for just a moment, and I'm going to switch over to the software that uh, I want to use for uh, tonight's main software I want to use for tonight's presentation, um, which is called Stellarium. And so I'll get that going here and try to share back with you again. So Stellarium is a free program that you can find uh, online. And uh, it is a, a basically a desktop planetarium program, if you will. Um, and uh, you can find it at stellarium.org and download it if you like to play with it. So I've set up our sky tonight uh, for 5 p.m., which is basically the, you know, the time we just started a couple minutes ago here, because I did want to show you Jupiter and Saturn again here low over in the southwestern sky. And again, they're going to be moving closer and closer together. Uh, and on the 21st, um, that's when you're going to want to look for them, you know, to see that closest conjunction. Now, I, I recommend looking for them before and after uh, because, you know, you never know the weather and how it's going to cooperate. Uh, but each day they're going to be moving closer and closer together. So if you can watch them over time, you'll actually be able to observe that sequence uh, of them moving closer and closer together. Now, if you're facing the direction south, as soon as it gets dark, again, Jupiter and Saturn are going to be there. This is about an hour after sunset, sunset right now, around 4 o'clock here in Maine. And also, you'll be able to notice uh, the planet Mars over here in our southeastern sky as well. And Mars was at its best back in October. Uh, on the 6th of October, it made its closest approach to Earth. And on the 13th, we had uh, where it was at opposition, visible from sunset uh, through sunrise. 
Now, we actually sent a spacecraft to Mars back in July of this year called uh, the Perseverance mission. And that's going to land in February. So be watching uh, the news because NASA is going to be covering a lot of that live on that uh, on the February 18th of the landing of the Perseverance rover on the planet Mars. So these are our evening planets right now. And to go to constellations, I'm actually going to change our perspective a little bit. I'm going to rotate us around here all the way until we're facing the direction north. And one of the reasons I like to do so is if we're facing north, we can start off with something that usually is pretty familiar to most folks. And that is this group of seven stars here, which is going to be very close to the horizon at five o'clock anyway. Uh, but these seven stars form the familiar pattern we often call the Big Dipper. And the Big Dipper uh, looks sort of like a giant pot or pan on a on the stove. Here's sort of the handle of that pan and this area of the bowl or sort of that area through there. Now, if you find the Big Dipper, um, it's actually part of a larger group uh, called Ursa Major, the Great Bear. And to see the bear, you have to add a few things to it. There are three stars out in front that mark the bear's head. A few stars down through here are the front legs. Hind legs kind of curl down to the horizon and these three make the tail. But before I draw in that bear, if you find the Big Dipper, the important thing you can use it to do is draw a line through these first two stars named Dubé and Merrick, out the open end, and go five times the distance between them, you'll come to this star right here, which is Polaris, or the North Star. Of the 50 brightest in the sky, this one's about 43rd or so on the list. So if I highlight it there, you see Polaris. And the reason it's so important is because all the other stars will appear to rotate around it as the Earth turns beneath our feet. So that's why that star is so important uh, in our nighttime sky. Again, it's only about 43rd on the list of 50 brightest stars. So it's not a very bright star. But again, you can find it by using that Big Dipper. Well, if I come back to the Big Dipper and I draw it in there, you're going to see that this is the way that bear would look there. Ursa Major, the Great Bear. And the North Star is part of the Little Dipper or the little bear right through here, which looks more like a spoon or a ladle, but there aren't any additional stars to add to it. So as a result, um, it's gonna take quite a bit of imagination to see a bear there in the sky. Well, constellations are just that. They're imaginary pictures that people drew a long time ago in the night sky, and they often have lots of different stories or legends that go with them. If we draw in these bears the way the ancient people imagined them, they look a little bit like this. So here again, you have sort of that great bear and that little bear. Now, if you've ever seen bears, perhaps in a zoo or on Discovery Channel, or if you happen to have a, a teddy bear lying around the house somewhere from children, uh, bears tend to have very short stubby tails. These two, however, you'll notice have very long tails, in fact, almost as long as their bodies. And there are numerous stories and legends about these bears and why they have such long tails and why they're in the sky. Uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, a Native American story from the Great Lakes region. I grew up in Wisconsin, and uh, the Menominee Indian tribe up there had a story about these bears that uh, goes a little bit like this. According to their legend, a long time ago, these two bears lived in the same forest with an Indian brave. And one day, all three were out exploring and looking for food when they came across a bee's nest full of honey. Well, everyone liked honey so much that they raced to it but the bears and the brave arrived at the same time and no one wanted to share. So they began to wrestle. Well, soon that bear or the brave, excuse me, got the better hand and he grabbed these bears by their short stubby tails. And he started to swing them around by their tails high over uh, his head. As he did so, their tails stretched out becoming longer and longer. And when he released them, they flew in the night sky changing into the stars we now see. And that's why these ba bears have such stretched out tails they're in the nighttime sky. But the rest of the legend talks about these bears and where they are in the sky over time. So the great bear typically walks on the horizon right in late September and early October. He's sort of just barely on the horizon at that time. And that's when his blood pours out upon the trees and the leaves turn color from the greens, the reds and yellows we see at that time of year. 
in winter, as the bear is very close and very low on the horizon, the trees weep for the bear by shedding their leaves and, be, and go bare. But in spring, when the bear rises up high overhead once again, the leaves will green up. And so this is their story, which explained both why the bear had such a long tail, but also a bit about the seasons. Because constellations were used, you know, both for navigation, for timekeeping, knowing when to plant and harvest, uh, their plant and harvest crops and a whole variety of other things uh, by people, you know, from all cultures. But that's one of the stories about the great bear there in the night sky. Again, it's kind of hard to see a bear, maybe with a stretched out tail. Uh, to me, I typically see a, you know, sort of a, a pot or pan and a spoon there in the sky for the most part. That might be a little bit easier. Well, I wanted to start with these because, uh, again, they're visible year round here in Maine. So any time of the year, you can go out and look for these two. But also because I wanted to put time into motion and take us a little bit later. While winter begins on the 21st of this month, the stars that you're seeing right away after sunset tonight are sort of mostly the stars of fall. So I did want to put time into motion. And this also will give you an idea of why that North Star is so important as well. So I'm going to pull back here just a little bit, put time into motion. And as we do so, you're going to notice something happening. All those stars, as I mentioned, are going to rotate around that North Star. So I'm going to take you to a little bit later tonight. In fact, I'm going to take you to about 9 p.m. or so. Just a little bit farther there. There we are at 9 p.m. tonight. Now you'll notice at 9 p.m. the bear is starting to move up in the sky. Give you an idea. So it's not quite at the horizon. So again, all these stars will appear to go around that North Star, which will stay stationary there um, in your nighttime sky. Well, I'm going to turn off those constellations for a, a moment. And now we're going to sort of rotate around back over. And you're going to notice something in our west and southwest. You'll see that by 9 PM, Jupiter and, of course, Saturn are no longer visible. And I'm going to head back here sort of towards the south and southeast a bit. The winter sky is really dominated by this group of stars right here, sort of in the, in the southeast around 9 o'clock tonight. And this group is the famous constellation of Orion, the great hunter or warrior. The star Betelgeuse uh, marks up one shoulder. Bellatrix is the other shoulder. Rigel and Safe are the legs. And then these three stars in a row, uh, Alnitak, Almalam, and Mintaka mark the belt of Orion, from which hangs a sword. In fact. The area underneath his belt actually is the Orion Nebula. It looks like a fuzzy sort of patch of light with your unaided eye, but with binoculars, you'd see it as a star forming region. Uh, there are stellar nursery, if you will, in Orion. Orion has sort of a faint shield out in front of him, and he also has his club raised overhead. So if we grab one of those stars in Orion, and grab Betelgeuse, and we draw him in, here is what Orion would look like. And this program also highlighted Iridanius, the river, which is a really faint group of stars. But there is a faint river that's supposed to be running underneath Orion's feet. Well, Orion is supposed to be a great hunter or warrior. And he's actually been seen as a variety of things. The Greeks call him Orion. Of course, Native Americans have called him Long Sash and sort of imagine him as firing a bow and arrow here. In Egypt, he was called Osiris and was seen as the god of the dead. Uh, sort of riding on a boat across the sky. Um, and in parts of China, he's seen as Shen, which is another type of warrior. And there's even areas that don't see him as a person that see something else there in that area of the sky. And I'll share that a little bit later. But let's start off with Orion. Orion is supposed to be a mighty hunter. And there's lots of different stories about Orion. So, uh, and these stories come primarily from the Greeks. So let's take a look a couple more constellations to help us go with Orion. First off, if we find Orion, and he's pretty easy to spot because of those four bright stars that mark up his shoulders and legs and the three that mark his belt. If you draw a line through his belt and you head up 
and sort of towards the right, you will come to a reddish orange star called Aldebaran, which marks the eye of Taurus the bull. And this V-shaped group of stars, if we zoom in a little bit here, this V-shape is the Hyades, and it marks the face of the bull. And up here are the tips of Taurus's horns. Riding on his back is a little cluster of stars called the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters. And people sometimes will mistake this for the little dipper because it has that shape, but it's really an open star cluster on its own. In fact, in Japan, they call it Subaru. If you ever look at a Subaru automobile, you'll notice those stars in its hood emblem. It's called Makali'i out in Hawaii, so lots of different names for it, depending on where you're from. Well, Taurus, if we draw him in, sort of looks like he's charging at Orion. And there does happen to be a story about these two constellations here in the night sky. So I'll draw them in, and there you see a little bit of Eridanius running underneath Orion's feet there as well. Well, one legend about Orion is that he was a very great hunter. And of course, whenever he would go out hunting, he usually would catch whatever he was looking for. It so happens that he was doing such a good job hunting that Mother Earth got worried. And she was very worried that if he kept hunting this way, he was gonna hunt all the animals and there wouldn't be any left. So she decided that she wanted to uh, punish Orion for this. And she sent a giant scorpion the size of a person to do battle with Orion. Well, Orion and the scorpion fought for several days, but in the end, it stung him in the heart. As Orion was dying, he crushed it with his club. So Diana, the goddess of the moon and of hunting, placed Orion in the winter sky and changed him into stars, and the scorpion in the skies of summer and changed it into stars. So the two would be at opposite ends of the heavens and could never battle again. And so we see Orion in the winter sky and the scorpion in the summer sky. So we don't see those two at the same time of year. But that's the story of why Orion is in the night sky. But Orion has lots of stories about them, including one involving these seven sisters here riding on the back of Taurus the bull. According to one legend, Orion was out hunting one day and he spotted these seven very beautiful sisters who were bathing in a pool. And he fell madly in love with not one, or two, but all seven. And he decided he was gonna marry, not one or two, but all seven. Well, their father Atlas was pretty wise and didn't want that to happen. So he placed the young ladies on the back of Taurus the bull to prevent Orion's advances. And that's why we see Orion and Taurus locked in battle over those seven sisters. And we'll see sort of Orion pushing that bull back across the sky, but he can never reach the sisters. They're in uh, our nighttime sky. And that's another story about Orion, uh, the hunter. So Orion and Taurus, very easy to spot in your winter sky. If you have binoculars, again, check out that Orion Nebula, which is a star forming region right below Orion's belt. And do check out the Pleiades, that really beautiful, it's a really beautiful star cluster. In fact, we'll do a little bit of zooming in here. If we go to Orion here and we zoom in on that nebula. This is of course a telescopic view. But here you can see that great Orion Nebula. It's a place, uh, basically a big cloud of gas and dust around 1300 light years uh, distant from us, about roughly 30 light years across. And it's a place where new stars are being born um, in that cloud of gas and dust there in Orion. And then coming up to the Pleiades, I mentioned the Pleiades is kind of a, a star cluster, if you will. And if we zoom in on the Pleiades, you can see, uh, again, there's a little bit of leftover gas and dust from the formation of the star cluster there. That's a little bit of a reflection nebula left over uh, in this area. But this is an open star cluster. Even though there are six or seven visible to your unaided eye, uh, there are well over uh, about uh, 300 members or so in the Pleiades, some of which are tiny red dwarf stars. But it is an open star cluster as well. So those are, again, Taurus and Orion. And we can use Orion to find a few other things in our night sky. Now, this is about nine o'clock. I'm gonna go ahead just a little bit farther here. And here we are about 940 or so, or just a hint, a bit farther than that. Here we are about 945. And one of the reasons I wanted to do that is we have Tor or Orion, excuse me, and we used it to find Taurus, but if we're, uh, up late enough tonight, we can use Orion to find several other things. One of those things is using the belt and going the opposite way 
and will come down to the brightest star visible from Earth other than our sun. And this star is called Sirius. And Sirius is also known as the dog star because it's in the constellation called Canis Major, Orion's hunting dog. There are three stars above it that form the head of the dog. Sirius is kind of where the collar would be. Maybe it has a shiny collar there. Here are the front legs, and then the body of the dog comes down like this, and the hind legs like that. So if we draw in that dog, there is Canis Major. You probably have to stay up to 10 o'clock to get all of his hind legs and tail up there in the night sky. Orion also has a small dog that you draw a line through his shoulders and you head towards the east and you'll come to Procyon and Gomesia, these two. Now, I don't know about you, but it's very hard for me to imagine a small dog with only two stars. Well, with the exception it's being dinner time, so maybe I could imagine uh, a sausage or a hot dog there in the night sky, but that's really the only type of dog possible in my mind to see with two stars. But Canis Major and Canis Minor are Orion's great hunting companions, and they will follow him across the sky on his hunts. If we use our imagination, we can draw those dogs in there, and there you sort of see them uh, following Orion across the sky. And as the Earth turns at night again, they are going to follow Orion across that nighttime sky. All right, well, I'm going to turn those off and we're going to head up a little bit above Orion. If we start with his foot star, Rigel, come up through his belt and Betelgeuse's shoulder and keep going, we'll come to two stars that look alike. And these two are Castor and Pollux, and they're the heads of the Gemini twins. Um, and Castor has sort of a long, uh, thin body with short, stubby legs, and Pollux has sort of a short body with longer legs there stretched out in the night sky. But those are the Gemini twins. And there's a story about those two twins. Uh, one legend is it that uh, these two twin brothers um, did everything together. And, but one day, uh, Castor was swept, and they became sailors when they grew up, and the Castor was swept off the deck of the ship. And his brother jumped in and tried to rescue him, but it was too late, and Castor had drowned. Well, Pollux was so heartbroken by this that um, he asked the gods if they would allow him to spend time with his brother. But because he was part immortal, they didn't want to let him do that. So they came up with a compromise that half of the year the brothers could be together in the night sky. So we'll see Castor and Pollux, those Gemini twins, for about half the year. And when they sink below the horizon, Castor has to return to the underworld, and Pollux goes about his business again, separated for another six months, according to one legend about them. But lastly, here in our constellations above Orion, if we come straight up through the middle of Orion, we would find a star called Capella. And Capella is in a pentagon-shaped group of stars called Origa or Origa. And if we draw that group in, it looks something like this. Now, when I was in Hawaii, they called this group of stars Hokulei. Hoku means star, and lei, uh, of course, means a wreath. So sometimes if you go out to Hawaii, you'd be given a lei of flowers, which is pretty traditional. And to me, that makes a lot more sense than trying to see this the way the Greeks saw it, because they saw it as Origa, or Origa, who is supposed to be a chariot driver carrying a goat. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a very difficult time using a pentagon group of stars and seeing either a chariot driver, a goat, or any combination thereof but that's the way the ancient Greeks saw it. Well, constellations sometimes are used uh, in honor of things, and that probably is the case with that chariot driver because it's pretty hard to imagine, uh, again, a chariot driver or a goat with that group of stars. Well, this whole region of the sky we were looking at, I'm going to turn off those figures there, but this whole region that we're looking at is sometimes called the winter circle or winter ellipse. It's made up of some of the brightest stars and constellations of the entire year. Winter is really one of the best seasons of the year to start learning your way around the sky. Uh, again, because if you can find Orion, you can use him to star hop either down to, to Sirius and Canis Major, up to Taurus the Bull and the Pleiades. Again, you can go through his shoulders to come to the Little Dog or through his from his foot through his belt and shoulder up to the Gemini twins and straight up above him to find Capella and Auriga the charioteer. So these are some of the brightest stars visible of the entire year. So it's really a, a good chance to learn your constellations. 
Now I mentioned the Gemini twins. Uh, one other special thing that's coming up, we talked about the conjunction earlier, but the Gemini twins, uh, something to mention there too, uh, there is the Gemini meteor shower, which is coming up and it's gonna be peaking on the evenings of the 13th and 14th. Uh, so that's coming up this Saturday, or the, excuse me, this, um, this Sunday and into Monday. And if you can find, when we say the Geminids, that means those meteors are gonna to appear to emanate from the constellation Gemini. And typically you'll get somewhere between, you know, 20 to 30 meteors an hour or so, though this year they're saying the sh that the shower might be a little bit better. Um, and you can start looking for this really around nine o'clock or so. The best time is probably gonna be near 11 o'clock when it's a little bit higher up in the sky, uh, but you might catch a few of those Gemini meteor showers this weekend um, and in, into early next week. So that's something else to be looking for um, in this area of the sky, if you will. Well, we have taken a look at some of those constellations uh, of this winter season. And again, again as I mentioned, uh, do get out there and, and uh, try and take a look for those. Um, since we had Mars up in our sky, we'll mention one of the fall constellations. And one other thing that's sort of worth seeing here as well, um, in the fall skies, um, you can see a group of stars very near Mars right now, just so happens, that looks almost like a, uh, a perfect square, if you will. Um, and uh, before I show you the, the sort of the modern, well, I should, I should, I'm going to show you a modern day version of this constellation before I show you the way the Greeks saw it. Um, if you imagine this is home plate in a baseball diamond, this would be first, second, and third. Here you have a, picture, or a couple of uh, batters walking up the plate. Catch your numpire back here. Um, and so this would be a nice all-star baseball game, if you will. The Greeks, when they were coming up with these constellations back in ancient times, didn't have baseball. So they imagined an upside down flying horse. Uh, this is the horse's stomach and its front legs. Here's the horse's back, his neck and his head, all the way to this star here called Enif, which marks the end of his nose. And so now if you draw on that constellation, this is Pegasus, that great winged horse there in the night sky. And he's seen sort of just the, the front half because he's emerging out of the ocean, according to one of the ancient Greek stories about him. Well, the nice thing about Pegasus is he will help you find something else that's pretty special to look at in the night sky. And that is the star we call first base is really known as Alphrats. It forms the head of a princess named Andromeda. And she looks like a, a V-shaped group of stars right off of sort of a, almost attached to Pegasus, if you will. In fact, if we grab one of her stars, this will sort of draw her in. But there's sort of two sets of stars here, uh, or two sets of pairs of stars, I should say. There's one pair here, another pair here. Uh, and then there's probably a third pair right out here. So that you could kind of imagine her as a V shape there. But just after that second pair, there's this little hazy smudge of light there. And that is the Andromeda galaxy. It's the most distant thing you can see with your unaided eye being about two and a half million light years away. All right, our own Milky Way galaxy, if we pulled back and had a view of our full night sky, you'd sort of notice this Milky Way stretching across the sky. In winter, it's relatively faint. The best time to see it is in summer when you're lo actually looking in towards Scorpius in the center of the galaxy. But in winter, looking out towards Orion, you're looking out towards the edge. But again, that's our own galaxy. But this little hazy smudge of light there, just by Andromeda, that's a separate galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy. And it's actually on a collision course with ours. Uh, a few billion years from now, our galaxy is going to actually merge with it and form a super galaxy, if you will. Well, those are some of the constellations and some things you can see in tonight's sky. And I'm going to go ahead and shift back now to talk a little bit about the Christmas star. So give me one second here and I'm going to jump back to my slides for a moment. And There we go. So uh, one last thing I'll mention is if you, if you enjoy things like this, the planetarium did start an online astronomy club earlier this year called the Universe Explorers of Maine. And you can find out about it at our website. We do star parties every Friday night where I'll do a, a tour of the, of the night sky, but then we look through some robotic telescopes. 
Um, so if you're interested, uh, we urge you to check out our website and learn about joining that, uh, that astronomy club. So, well, we wanted to talk a little bit about the Christmas star tonight as well, since we're getting very close to the Christmas holidays uh, coming up. And so for centuries, of course, astronomers, uh, theolo you know, uh, theologians and others have pondered what was the Christmas star and why did three wise men from uh, you know, a journey to distant Bethlehem and what were they really following? Um, and there's a little bit of mystery about this because uh, we don't know so much about it. So uh, the reason that people often think about the Christmas star is there are a number of verses in Matthew 2 that talk about it. And I didn't grab the, the entire passage, but I grabbed just a couple things to show where this is from. So um, of course, it talks about when Jesus is, was born, that there, be, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east. So that's the first reference. That's kind of interesting. The second reference is that Herod had, didn't see the star. And we know this because he inquired of them when the star appeared. So we knew that Herod didn't really see the star or didn't know what it was about. Um, and they also talk about following the star. So that's sort of a third little piece uh, from, again, from this passage. And so that's really the reference we have. It's the only gospel that, uh, uh, you know, in the Bible that references the star. So we need to start asking some questions. Well, who were the Magi? Because if you're looking for the star of Bethlehem, why were these, you know, Magi or three kings as they're sometimes called, why would they have been following the star? And so uh, uh, from, what we've been able to learn through historical records, we think that they were probably Persian astrologer priests who studied the sky to look for signs. Because again, um, you probably have heard of horoscopes and really the Zoroastrians, the ancient Persians developed horoscopes by watching where the sun would set versus the different patterns of stars and then tried to, and thought the planets might be gods or goddesses that had power over us depending on their positions. Um, so they might've watched these things. So, and they probably were aware of the different prophecies of, you know, a, a Messiah. Um, and so anyway, this is probably, you know, one of, the, one of the pieces of evidence we have in terms of why these uh, three, you know, or why the, the Magi, we don't really know their number, sometimes it's thought of, of three because of the three gifts, but why they would have been following a star. Now, we really don't think it was a star necessarily. In fact, the most popular idea from the star of Bethlehem is that it was a close grouping of planets or a close grouping of a planet and a bright star. So we think it was some type of alignment. Again, because Herod didn't see it, uh, we think that's probably the case. So it may have been a grouping of multiple planets that were significant. And that may have been interpreted as this star of Bethlehem. There are some things we think it probably was not. We don't think it was a comet because comets typically were seen as symbols of death and doom and destruction and wouldn't probably be appropriate for heralding the birth of, uh, you know, of, a, of a king or a messiah. The other thing we don't think is they probably weren't meteors because meteors you wouldn't be able to follow for any period of time because it's or a shooting star because that's basically a flash of light and gone. And we don't think it's a nova because when we look back in time and we know novas have been recorded by many people, we don't see any novas near the time period uh, of when Christ supposedly was born. So we think more than likely it was a planetary alignment. And there are a couple different alignments that took place uh, that are believed to be the ones that could have been, you know, potentially again, from a scientific point of view, uh, this supposed Christmas star. So one, was there was a conjunction in uh, the years three, between three and two BC. Uh, so in September of three BC, we would have seen Jupiter in the stars of Leo the lion uh, in the morning sky. And this is a, a very interesting thing because what happens is Jupiter actually has a, passes the bright star Regulus in Leo three times. Uh, during this time period. So it's what we call a triple conjunction, which were considered to be very significant by, you know, ancient astrologers. So the first time is, you know, we see it happening is in September 14th. 
then in February 17th of 2 BC and, follow, and finally in May 8th of 2 BC. So basically Jupiter passes Regulus, then it goes into retrograde motion, it comes back and passes it again in February and then moves, continues to move forward until May. During that time period, Leo moves from being in the evening sky, or in the morning sky, excuse me, to being in the evening sky. And also at that same time, Venus starts to draw into the sky. And on the evening of June 17th of 2 BC, just after this triple conjunction, Jupiter and Venus came together for a conjunction of their own that would have been so close that they would have appeared as a single star. And that single union may have been, possibly, it's one explanation for what the Christmas star would have been. Number one, it would have been very brilliant because Venus is typically the third brightest thing we see and Jupiter the fourth brightest thing we see in the sky. So this would have been very, very bright. But notice that this is a, a length of time and we know that if they had to travel from Persia to, uh, to uh, you know, first Jerusalem and then to Bethlehem, that it would have taken them some time. So this would have been several months of time, again, from September, you know, they could have started to see that, figured out there was a, a triple conjunction happening and then could have started their travels to get there, all right? And so another thing is that Jupiter is considered to be uh, a planet that represents uh, kings. Venus is seen as, a, typically was seen as a goddess of fertility. And so Jupiter and Venus coming together also could have been assigned to the Persian astrologers, again, of a birth. And so, uh, and may have been seen as sort of a marriage union, uh, followed by the birth of Christ potentially in uh, 1 BC or so. And this is how it would have looked in the sky. Again, Venus and Jupiter, when they were at their closest, would have appeared as one object uh, in the constellation of Leo. Um, and so that's one, one possibility, if you will. And one of the reasons this one is, is somewhat favored by, uh, by a lot of uh, uh, astronomers and, and uh, 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 theologians is because of the fact that it also corresponds with uh, shortly thereafter in about 180, there was an eclipse of the moon and Herod supposedly died after an eclipse of the moon. Um, and so this sort, sort of seems to line up and could have possibly been a good candidate for that star of Bethlehem. Now we're having a Jupiter-Saturn conjunction that I mentioned is, you know, hasn't been as good. The last time it was this good was in 1623, about 400 years ago. So there also happened to be a Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in 7 BC. And this is the other big contender for the possible star Bethlehem. And uh, basically this would have happened from May through December. Um, and Jupiter and Saturn would have come together in the constellation of Pisces. And again, they would have been moving one direction, then to slow down and stop, then into retrograde with Jupiter again, and then finally ending up here in December again with that conjunction. So this is another triple conjunction, in this case of Jupiter and Saturn, not of Jupiter with Regulus per se, uh, in the constellation of Pisces. And Pisces or the fish also uh, might have had some significance. And so that's another one reason. And there was another eclipse that was close to this time that could have been the possible one uh, relating to Herod's death, according to the historians as well. So these are probably the two best contenders for what the star of Bethlehem uh, may, have, may have been. A couple other notes here. Again, Venus was associated with the goddess of fertility. That's why that two, three, BC one probably would have been, uh, you know, it was possibly is, is the favored one, if you will. Um, and also uh, this conjunction took place in Leo the lion and Leo again, uh, uh, and Regulus in particular was considered the king star, but also uh, according to uh, biblical records, Christ, uh, you know, was from the tribe of Judah. And so Leo the lion also could have been associated with that. And so that, again, this is may have been what was considered significant enough to be imagined as the Christmas star. Uh, but Pisces also is a sign of the fish and oftentimes, uh, you know, Christ used the fish as a symbol too. So it's really hard. It's really hard. And that's why no one really knows. Uh, we can only look back in time, see what was in the sky 
and try to figure out what it what it was. But really, in my mind, it doesn't matter, you know, what the star necessarily was, but more what it stands for. And uh, regardless of, of, uh, of background, I think, you know, the Christmas star is, is supposed to be a symbol of hope, uh, friendship, love, and kindness, uh, and most of all, concern for all creatures. And I think that's something that uh, is good for all of us to ponder this season and always. Uh, and of course, it, it stands for, you know, peace on earth and goodwill to all everywhere, uh, which also in my mind is, is a good thought to have uh, at the holidays. So uh, again, this is just sort of looking at what it may have been from a, a scientific and historical point of view, uh, but this is the best guess of, of what the Christmas star uh, may have been. And, uh, but wanted to share that. And since we have this conjunction of uh, Saturn and Jupiter, I, I say go out and look at it and, and maybe, uh, you know, that, that's happening on the, on the 21st, uh, maybe a great uh, way to be thinking about uh, that possible um, Christmas star. So I'll leave up uh, our website here uh, and uh, our Facebook page. We uh, have a variety of information at those two sites. Our, our website has a variety of astronomy resources as well in the Astronomy Club. And our Facebook page, we let you know about different things that are happening uh, both in the sky, but also uh, here at the planetarium too. Um, and uh, so those are some of our information. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Sean. That's fascinating. We do have some questions uh, that we'll post to you. And just a reminder to everybody, if you want to pose a question, just go to the chat button at the bottom of your screen and type in your question and hit the return button. And we will uh, uh, feed those to Sean, share those with Sean uh, uh, as many as we can while time allows. Uh, we have several questions that came in asking you to comment on other celestial sites right now that uh, people could be looking at or should be looking for with the naked eye. Uh, can you talk about what they could be seeing right now without the assistance of binoculars or, uh, or telescopes? Sure. Well, the, the constellations that we, uh, we looked at you know, tonight, all of those are going to be visible. And if you go out earlier in the evening, I, I know we went up, we stayed up a little bit later till around nine o'clock or so, but early in the evening, you will find uh, Pegasus and you'll also find Andromeda. Uh, you can also see Cetus, the, the sea monster. He's gonna be a little bit below Pegasus there in the night sky and Pisces. Uh, right now, Mars is actually in the area of Pisces. So that gives a little bit of an idea. And Mars, of course, Jupiter and Saturn, all of those things are gonna be visible um, with your unaided eye. So you can, you know, there's lots of things to see in the night sky. Uh, the last couple of days, there was the prediction that there might be a Royal because we had some, um, uh, some big solar activity going on, but it seems to have fizzled. Uh, and I know I looked at the auroral ring uh, just before coming online tonight, and it doesn't look like we're going to be having any aurora in the next few days. I always tell folks there's no season for aurora. You just have to, it depends on how much solar activity there is. If there's a big outburst, then sometimes we'll get those. Um, the other thing that you can be looking for with your unaided eye are satellites. There's a number of them that are visible. Now, the ISS actually passed over tonight between 5 o'clock and 5.03. Uh, at least the last time I was outside today, it was cloudy, so I don't think that we would have had a chance to see it. Um, it is going to make another pass on the 18th of December um, in the early morning skies, and then you'll have to wait uh, until around the 20th. But from the 20th to the 29th, it's going to be making lots of morning passes. If you're an early morning riser around 4 a.m., you can get out there and see the International Space Station. Also in the morning sky right now, you have Venus uh, right before sunrise. So if you are up early in the morning, look to the east for Venus. So those are some of the things you'd see with your unaided eye. That's great. Uh, a question about the uh, uh, meteor shower that you referred to. Uh, should, uh, how long should we expect to see that in the, uh, in the night sky? And at what times would we be uh, are there any times in particular that we should be looking? Well, the peak nights are going to be sort of the 13th and the 14th, and the best time is probably going to be around, you know, around 11 o'clock or so at night. Meteor showers are, are sort of, you know, uh, a little bit, you know, they're, they're one of those things that you, you, you want to watch for a while because that's really how they present themselves. They're not something that you go out and you take a glance at, you know, you, you kind of have to wait. So I, 
I recommend, you know, those evenings, the 13th or 14th, maybe going outside for an you know, hour, hour and a half, like from nine to 11, or, you know, maybe 9.30 to 11, and giving a, a look. And if, if the sky, of course, if it's clear. And you wanna be, you know, looking towards that constellation of Gemini because the, the meteors will appear to emanate from that area. That's why it's called the Gemini meteor shower. I have a question here, just uh, uh, how, how do we know uh, how, and how do scientists know uh, how to, determine what was in the sky on a particular day, whether we're talking about yes, well, not yesterday, but we're talking about 100 years ago, thousands of years ago. Could you walk, walk us through that sort of astronomy 101 question? Sure. So with the, the positions of the planets uh, in particular, we, we know the way planets move in our sky and we can predict the way they, they move. Uh, over time, of course, you know, Kepler figured out the way planets move around the sun. Uh, Newton refined it, and, and we now really know very, very ac accurately how planets move, which is why we can predict, you know, we were able to predict way ahead of time that this event that, that's going to happen on the 21st of December, that, you know, the, uh, Jupiter and Saturn are going to be really close together. So basically, by knowing those motions of the planets over time, we can basically, it's like winding a clock backwards. We can wind the clock backwards to show what planets were in the sky at that time, where they would be, and what they would look like. So that, that part with the planetary, the planetary alignments is pretty easy to do. The other reason is that the ancient people kept lots of records of, of what was in the sky as well. The Babylonians did, the Chinese did, numerous cultures wrote things down. In fact, up until some years ago, the Babylonian eclipse tablets were still being referenced because they were very, very accurate in terms of things. So, you know, so rec historical records of things um, in the sky. So that's why we know, for instance, that there were no novas or, you know, or supernovas, which are really bright star, basically stars that are dying, but they, they explode and they become very bright in the sky. We know there were really none during the, the time period of near Christ when, you know, Christ was supposed to be born. So that's one reason, you know, we don't consider those. And even comets. We, we know that, you know, Halley's Comet was around around 12 BC, so far too early, uh, you know, for, for that as well. And there were no other significant comets in the sky. So it's a matter of both running time backwards in terms of the planetary stuff, but then looking at historical records from numerous cultures of what was in the sky as well, or some of the other objects. Very good. Thanks. We have uh, many folks who are uh, watching tonight who are watching with children. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we have a question about our, what books would you recommend that would help kids learn more about the night, night sky? Uh, both kids at all ages, uh, anything you would recommend? Oh, yes. So I, um, I grew up with books. I'm a big fan of books. And I, I, books are, I think, even better than any of the little apps or things you can do. So uh, and, and uh, I'm from the generation that had Curious George by H.A. Ray. And H.A. Ray did two books, one for younger children called The Constellations, and uh, one that's geared for a little bit older children and maybe uh, adult basic called The Stars. Uh, so by H.A. Ray, you can find them on Amazon and they're, they're very uh, easy to, you know, both are very easy to, to use. Um, the, the Constellations is geared for really young children and the stars, like I say, for a little bit older. Um, and then for, for adults, uh, books I recommend, Turn Left at Orion uh, by Guy Casamagno or uh, Night Watch by Terrence Dickinson are some of the really good guides for adults. Terrific. Terrific. And we'll make sure, folks, that when we follow up with you, we'll share that information. In case you weren't able to jot it down now, we'll share it with the email that we send out along with the survey. So uh, we have a question about binoculars. What binoculars would you recommend for stargazing? Generally, I, I recommend 10 by 50s um, for basic stargazing. So with binoculars, you have two numbers. Uh, you, you have the, the first number, the 10 or whatever, typically is this, the magnification, how much it's magnifying. And the second number, like 50, is the diameter of the, the aperture of, uh, the, of the lens, if you will, the large lens, the objective lens, which is collecting light. So 50 millimeters is a good size, uh, you know, and 10 magnification will get you some good things in terms of like Jupiter with the moons 
or you know, being able to see some star clusters. Now with binoculars, it's really good to put them on a tripod because if you're looking for the moons of Jupiter, even if you just shake a tiny bit, remember uh, that that's gonna be magnified 10 times. So to, to see the moons, I often tell folks, you really do need a tripod to, to mount those binoculars on. Uh, but binoculars are a great way to start stargazing because uh, you can use them for sporting events and birding and other things in addition to uh, stargazing. And when you get into telescopes, typically they're more really you know, specialized uh, for looking at the sky. But 10 by 50s are the ones I would recommend. Uh, you could also do seven by 50s. I really would say you want 50 millimeter because the, the diameter, the larger the diameter, the more light you're gathering in. And so, you know, like seven by 35s, the, the diameter is smaller, it's a little bit tougher. And also you don't have the field of view through them. So uh, yeah, 10 by 50s or, or seven by 50s are, are really good starts. Oh, that's terrific. Yes, I had a question asking you to follow up on, uh, on the Northern Lights, if you could, uh, give us all a little bit of quick overview about Aurora Borealis and why they are what they are and what they aren't. Yeah, so basically uh, the Aurora Borealis are caused by uh, particles from the sun. So our, our sun has uh, weather. We often don't think, think of it as, as having weather, but it does, it has sunspots. There also are prominences and flares uh, and coronal mass ejections that can you know, release particles from the sun. Well, when those particles travel out on the solar wind, uh, they, they travel out through our solar system. We have a magnetic field that protects us from a variety of this radiation, which is very good. And what happens is those charged particles, though they will enter through our north and south poles, uh, and as they enter in, uh, those charged particles will ionize and light up. And that's why we see what we call the aurora australis or aurora borealis in the northern hemisphere, aurora australis in the southern hemisphere. And they're a mirror image in the north and the south when we have aurora. And uh, other planets get them too. We've seen, you know, using a, a variety of, of imaging, you know, and some of our spacecraft have seen, you know, aurora at Jupiter and at Saturn uh, because they have magnetic fields and the same thing happens with them. Um, now, the farther north you are, the more often you will see them. But uh, occasionally we've had bursts that can be seen farther south. We get them here in Maine on occasion. Um, and, but it just depends on how much solar activity there is. And I do remember back in, I want to say it was around 2003, there was a display that was big enough. Uh, I was living in Louisville at the time, and uh, it was visible as far south as Texas because there was a huge solar storm uh, that really you know, uh, gave us an incredible display of northern light. But that's how they're why they're what they're made up of. You might say they're charged particles from the sun that enter our our atmosphere and then uh, ionize and light up. Well, Sean, this has been a wonderful presentation. We really appreciate it and are really uh, uh, fascinating. And uh, folks, if you uh, make sure you take down the website again, we'll share it with you too. But it's it should be there right on your screen right now. Uh, check out the, the website and the Facebook page there. And uh, uh, Sean Latch from the Burson Power Astronomy Center and Maynard Jordan Planetarium, thank you so much for, uh, for this presentation. And thank you to Novios Bistro in Bangor for sponsoring tonight's event and for its support of the university in many other ways. Uh, our next week, we'll be doing an event uh, somewhat related to this. Uh, I think it ties in nicely. On December 16th, our next session is, uh, is going to be about the uh, importance of the month of December to world religions. And the presenter will be Derek Michu, who is a faculty member in the philosophy department, and he teaches uh, world religions. Uh, and studies that in Judaic studies as part of uh, the minor program that he teaches on campus as well. So uh, hopefully you'll be able to join us for that. If you got an invitation to this tonight, you're going to get an invitation to that as well, or maybe you've already received it, but we hope you'll be able to join us. So again, thank you, Sean, and thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. Stay well, take care. Thank you so much, take care.